Hi, I'm Gavin, and welcome back to The Sound Project. So today I have my good friend Don Flynn here with me. Thanks so much for joining us. Hey, Gavin. Great to see you. Thank yeah. you for having me. Yeah, so Don is an audiologist uh, with Ear Everything, and we've known each other for a long time. It's been 20, 20 years 20-something so. years, yeah. correct. And uh, um, You've, you've always taught us so much about a lot of things uh, when it comes to our hearing. Uh, most importantly, uh, you've done ear molds for the team in, in uh, uh, different um, uh, times and where we get these awesome, I talk about them all the time, the the, hear, uh, the hearing protection that I use where it's got decibel filters built Correct. into them. And uh, I recommend them to everyone and you <laughs> at the same time. So, um, But I wanted to, to uh, have you on the podcast to talk a little bit about, uh, we'll start with your background, like how you got sure. into audiology and, and maybe... Uh, it's kind of that. a mistake, oh, happy no. mistake, yeah. wrong place, wrong time. And that seems to be the trend or the theme of my entire career. Mm -hmm. Just don't forget to be grateful, right? <laughs> yeah. So uh, I was going to go to be a veterinarian. My father's a veterinarian. I went to Indiana University and was going to do some pre-vet studies. And I despised all of the science that was behind it. Mm -hmm. And so I ran into somebody that was doing speech and hearing sciences. And I thought that would be excellent and it was interesting to me. And there always seemed to be like this drawn, I was always drawn to people with hearing aids or I always seemed to notice that on people. Yeah. Um, so I went over to the speech and hearing school and I applied to be in there. And mostly they train you to be a speech language pathologist. Mm -hmm. The school is, um, it covers speech and hearing, but most of, of the undergraduate curriculum is the speech uh, focused. Sure. So... I loved the hearing conservation class and it was 20 minutes in our intro to audiology class. Okay. And I remember that's where I first heard about musicians earplugs, which is what you were referring to mm -hmm. earlier. So then I went to graduate school and I got a master's degree in audiology and nowhere in that program did anybody mention like music in audiology. So, but they may have, and I may have skipped over it in my brain because Berkeley School of Music was around the corner. Mm -hmm. And bluntly, we used to fit musicians' earplugs to them, but I never, my brain never made the connection. Mm -hmm. So when I moved back to Indianapolis, I was dispensing hearing aids, and hearing aids is not very rewarding mm -hmm. all the time. Sure. It's People feel like they're getting taken advantage of, and that's not a fun professional job to have. For sure. So when I saw in-ear monitors come about, I started to inquire about those. And then serendipitously, someone phoned the hearing aid office. They asked for the in-ear monitors, and I found out more directly the information. I got hooked up with a company out of Chicago, Sensophonics. Yay, Sensophonics. Mm -hmm. We love them. And, um, and started this career. Yeah. Yeah. And so uh, what year did you start your business? I incorporated in December of 1999. So I officially started like January of 2000. So this yeah. year we're finishing 24 years. I'm exciting or excited for 25 yeah, next that's year. That's thing. pretty cool. That's really cool. Yeah. And when you first started, was it uh, was it mostly the hearing aids that you started at or did you get right into? So the... I quit that job at the hearing aid place because mm. I did not like it yeah. very much. And I ended up, um, I was bartending to supplement my bills while I thought I was doing the right businessy thing, was building a business from zero dollars. Don't yeah. do that, folks. Get a loan, <laughs> build credit for your business. Um, but I loved it. And I was trying to hustle both sides of it. And the bar that I was working at, they also had musicians that were coming in. And so I would just talk about it all the time. I had a couple of takers for some musicians earplugs. Uh, but the turning point for me and where I sort of stepped a little bit away from music, I became a race car audiologist. Um, there was a person who came into the pub and heard what I was talking about and noted that it would work in another field. Yeah. And I relied on them. They introduced me to two other people. And then all of a sudden I became the audiologist for the IndyCar series. That's right. So, and that was interesting. They didn't have anybody monitoring hearing. Really? OSHA doesn't regulate hearing conservation in music or motorsports. That's wild. Like two of the loudest. Uh, I know. But I don't know. Do we really want them telling us how loud it should be? People yeah. go to the races for the race car engine noise, mm -hmm. right? Sure. So. Yeah. 
Yeah. So the uh, and I know that's uh, the bulk of what you do now. I believe is IndyCar and and musicians earplugs, right? Correct. Okay. Yes. Everything is all about hearing conservation. I yeah. may dispense about a half a dozen to a dozen hearing aids mm-hmm. or pairs of hearing aids in a year. Yeah. What uh, is there anything about those two industries, the IndyCar and the musicians uh, that you work with, um, that you like one over the other, or they're just probably different? I am not a race car fan. <laughs> I have just been subjected to this community of people, and they are a wonderful community yeah. of people. Yeah. Also, I think musicians are a wonderful community of people. Yeah. I definitely have a little more fun in the music, music thing. area. Yeah, see, I've lived in Indiana for the majority of my life. I think it's only been maybe six or seven years of my life I've lived elsewhere. And I've never been to Indy 500. I've been to like time trials. So we'll change that this yeah. year, Gavin. <laughs> nice. That would be fun. But uh, yeah, I'm not a big race car fan myself. But um, you know, I definitely I mechanical engineer by degree, so I, I you know, it's it's a impressive feats that they pull off. But I just I don't get into it like I do other sports. The science is interesting, and my involvement with them got really heavy because they were unbeknownst to me, they were seeking an earpiece manufacturer Mm -hmm. that they could embed a sensor into the earpieces along with the speech transmission from the the teams to the cars. And so in an Indy car, if you're unfamiliar, there's an accident data recorder. There are tons of sensors marked everywhere around the car, and now we have them in the driver's ears. And so if the accident data recorder notices a change in acceleration of whatever the technical team sets it at, the the accident data recorder starts measuring from all of the sensors, including the ones in In their earpieces. So it's a technical, it's a three-piece or three-axle um, accelerometer, a triaxle yes. accelerometer. Okay. And it's it's pretty neat to have been a part of that. And within that program is where I kind of made sure th- that I had a job for a while. Mm-hmm. They wanted this to be a mandatory piece of safety equipment, oh. right? And so I told them, if you're going to make everybody wear this, we should probably validate the physical fit of it. Mm-hmm. And we should do that by establishing a baseline, how they hear today, and then monitor for change over time. Wow, yeah. And I am proud to say that for some of the drivers that I have 17, 18, 19 years in a row of their audiograms, mm-hmm. they don't show any degradation, wow. which means that we're being successful yeah. in, in teaching and passing on the information and the appropriate products for That's them. That's huge, because before you were doing that, and it, it you know, I'm sure that some of those older race car drivers were struggling with hearing loss late in their, their career. Yeah. I tell a story. Um, Jeff Gordon, uh, you, you yeah. may be familiar no, with Gordon. him because yeah. he's from Indiana. Yeah. Um, the Orlando Sentinel phoned me and uh, he and I were both quoted in the same article. And he was asked about his hearing and he goes, well, you know, it's motorsports, so it gets worse every year. And that that's just... It's what they believe, but it's not real, right? Mm -hmm. We can stop it because hearing loss is a function of intensity versus duration and your cumulative exposures, Mm -hmm. and we could stop it in its tracks. The the noise type of hearing injury, we could stop it in its tracks if we start changing the things that we do. Yeah. Well, and the ones that you got for me, the musicians' earplugs, they... Uh, I have a 15 decibel filter in them and I use them for everything. Like when I cut the grass, yep. uh, I have them. If I'm going to cut wood in the garage, I always, I tell people um, to wear them when they fly, like uh, because you know, how st- stressed out people think that the stress of travel is why you get so tired but i always tell people a lot of it's just processing noise i'm sure i learned that from you well Um, right loud noise has been proven mm -hmm. to be disorienting fatiguing irritating it changes your heart rate it changes your respiration yeah so one of the best compliments i ever got was from a race car driver named dirk mueller he goes dawn it brings such a calm to the race car yeah and that's really an important thing you're trying to function do your job and music is not noise but your ears don't know the difference so Even if your job is in music, you have to be aware of the intensity, how loud is the sound and the length of time that you're there and how many times, sorry, how many times you keep exposing yourself there. Well, and I think it is a, you know, it's kind of a joke of when you're lost in a city, you turn down your music so you can concentrate. Like that's a real thing. It's a real thing. Yeah, Yeah. Yeah. And, um, you know, with musicians, I, I know a lot of musicians that we work with that when we're doing studios for them, um, as they get older in life, they're just like, yeah, you know, it's just my hearing is what it is because they didn't take care of it, you know, uh, along the way. So. Well, nobody spoke about it. Nobody yeah. spoke about it. And then at a National Hearing Conservation Association conference, there was a paper being presented. And it was terribly ironic that the sound guys 
they do not want to wear anything in their ears because they don't want the image uh, being put out to the the concert goer mm. that the sound guy's wearing something in their ears. Sure, sure. And then the old dudes that used to load in and load out, they they would get mad at the young kids with good hearing, and they'd be like, "You know nothing because your hearing is way too good. You haven't been doing this long enough." They would right. wear it like a badge, a badge of, of honor. honor. <laughs> Which is not. No. I mean, you only get your hearing once, and so. Yes, and I think most of my passion in what I do, I have no idea how I found it all other than the story that <laughs> I told you, but it is that there is a emotional component. When you have hearing loss, um, you find yourself kind of isolating yourself. Oh, no, honey, you take the kids to that restaurant. Mm -hmm. I can't hear anything when we go there. It's yeah. going to be group situations and background noise that – really create an issue in yeah. having a conversation. Right. And if you can't have conversation, you, you start to become... More secluded, yeah. Yes, yeah. yes. Well, and one time we did a, a church project in Geist, uh, kind of near here, and we do a subjective listening test when we uh, do a church project where we have people from the congregation sit in different locations, and I read a list of standardized words, and they circle what they think they heard. Oh. Um, and it's interesting to see which words they miss, because mm -hmm. that lines up with certain frequency ranges, Yes, and uh, we can kind of focus in on that. And this one sweet lady came up to me, and she's like, can I take part in this test? Because I have hearing loss. And yep. I was like, absolutely, because that's real world for you. I'd love to know how you're actually hearing. And she got 7% correct. Yes. And it was like, I just thought of her, I, I think of her often of just like, man, she's going to church every Sunday and not understanding what is going on. And um, and then also people uh, a lot of times don't want to, you know, churches will have assisted listening devices, but people feel like they're handicapped Correct. when that, that happens or that, that something is, is uh, uh, you know, they're looked at a certain way if they rely on those devices. Right. And so obviously the more that we can protect it, the less situations like that we can get in. So, Agreed. Yeah. Um, so one thing, uh, every time that you come and do a, a mold for us or, or, or we sit down and talk, I learn so much from you. <laughs> and it's a field that like, I know acoustics, architectural acoustics, but I, I don't know this uh, like you do. And so I thought it'd be great for our audience to learn a little bit more about uh, the, the ear, how it functions, and uh, kind of step into your world a little bit. So I asked you to kind of put together a little presentation, and uh, maybe you could talk through that. Sure, yeah. We'll skim through a couple of things here. Mm -hmm. um, my fancy little cover photo there. Um, I thought it was cute. I called it sound understanding. <laughs> ha ha, a little play on words. Uh, in this slide, I kind of define what an audiologist is and just understanding the role that I'm supposed to play in your life if you are a person who works or performs in noise and hearing loss is a threat for you. Mm -hmm. um, my education, uh, my specific job description, and then it, it is important to note that there are two organizations that certify audiologists nationally. we got a American Speech and Hearing Association and a American Academy of Audiology. Okay. So it's nice when your audiologist has some initials after there that associate with one of those. Sure. Um, the anatomy is really important. Nobody, it's To me, it's always like going to the mechanic, right, and not knowing how the car works, so you can't tell whether they're telling you the truth or not. Sure. And I always find that if I educate the person on how their auditory system is supposed to function under normal circumstances, and then I show them how it degrades as a result of being exposed to the noise, it's it's not so mysterious. And then it gives them this power to want to be able to master it, work yeah. with it. Yeah. So um, essentially, I mean, there's way more parts than this, but this is just an overview. So you've got an outer ear, a middle ear, and an inner ear, and I'm working from the outside in, right? And so this big thing on the side of your head, your auricle, your pinna, it collects the sound, it focuses it down the ear canal. The ear canal is a tube closed at one end. So like you know acoustics of a room, mm -hmm. I know acoustics of a tube closed yeah. at one end. Uh -huh. um, and that closure is in fact the ear drum which is a membrane, and that membrane reacts to the vibration of the sound pressure that's coming down the ear canal. And that membrane, the tympanic membrane, it starts the middle ear system now. So you've got your eardrum, the hammer, the anvil, and the stirrup, or the incus, the malleus, and the stapes, and this is an impedance mismatch system. So this system is taking energy from the larger surface area of your eardrum and focusing it on the pinpoint of the foot plate of the stirrup. Okay. And that stirrup will sit in a membranous window um, of the cochlea, and this is where our site of lesion is as a result of noise injury. And again, music is not noise, 
but your ears don't know the difference. Mm -hmm. So this cochlea is snail shaped and it has fluid inside of it. It's way more complicated than I'm describing, but for simple sake here, yeah. it's got fluid. And then on the bottom, it's got like little hairs in there, like grass, right? Mm -hmm. And so as the eardrum is being moved by the sound pressure coming through the ear canal, it's moving those three small bones, which is then pushing on that membranous window and making that fluid come around the cochlea. Mm -hmm. And as that fluid is hitting those little hairs in those different areas of the two and a half turns of the cochlea, it's causing excitation. And then it's sending an ionic release and an electrochemical signal that your brain is putting back together as sound. So you can see how complicated it is and how important it is that all of those little structures are working the right way right. to convert sound on the outside. It's like a uh, analog to digital, digital to analog converter, mm -hmm. right? So inside here, let's get a little closer. So there's one here. This is the cochlea. What I always find super interesting is that the cochlea, it is tonotopically arranged. Mm. So its organization is from low pitch to high pitch. And it starts at the, the center, the apical end, and moves around to the basilar end. And it's in that first bend that we have the hair cells that are responsible for frequencies between 3,000 and 6,000 hertz, which is, what we lose. which is where noise exposure occurs. It is, and it makes no difference the sound, the 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 intent, the frequency of the sound that you're listening to. It is intensity versus duration. How loud is the sound? How long are you there? And your mm -hmm. repeated exposures, yeah. and that those little hairs they get worn away, and so it's like a bandwidth of nothing yeah. and if there is no if there's no hair cells there is no way for your brain to receive the information that information gets stalled right, right. there right yeah i mean that i had my hearing tested maybe three or four years ago and uh, luckily they told me that i had the hearing of a small child and i was like does that mean i just don't listen to people yeah or right like, what? but <laughs> but they did say that because and it's because i protect it because of you you well, know like i appreciate that oh well i appreciate you <laughs> for that um it, it, yes I always find it a little interesting when they try and compare it. You're hearing, it's it's your hearing. Yeah. It's either within normal limits or it's outside normal limits. Right. There really is no height or weight chart. Sure. So I can't put you in like some percentage of <laughs> yeah. people your age. Right. Um, but here's a slide. Here's a picture. Mm -hmm. I believe you guys can see it on your computer screens. But yeah. you can see how there's just this bandwidth of no receptor cells. And yeah. so if that does not carry away. on, your brain doesn't have the opportunity to put it back together. Together. Right. Um, people tell me it sounds like Charlie Brown's teacher, group situations and background noise. And yep. that background noise masks over your brain's ability to detect those soft, distinguishing features of speech. Yeah. And in English, one more and then I'll let you talk, I no. promise. Um, in English, the vowels, they're voiced. Yeah. So there's power, there's all your power is in those low frequencies yeah. and the high frequencies, which are distinguishing features of mm -hmm. speech. Your brain can't hear it in the background noise. Yeah, that, that's what we see a lot of times in these like large rooms that we're we're working with. Like, if, for instance, it's most things are made out of plaster in the room, then the low end is going to decay longer than the mids and highs are, and then that's going to mask speech intelligibility. And all of our understanding is in the consonant sounds like C, T, and S. And Correct. If if it's worn away and you can't actually receive that information, it makes makes it even worse so this combined with a bad room um it's just you don't have no, you don't have a chance correct yeah. now interesting those musicians earplugs they eliminate the reverberation so that decay you don't really hear that decay yeah. recurring and recurring yeah which i have some friends that have mild hearing loss and they've chosen to wear hearing protection in restaurants pubs yes. environments where there's a lot of people talking and i noticed that when i fly like i always wear them when i fly and at first the person sitting next to me feels like they can't talk to me but i can hear them better than yeah. than i could before i yeah. can have a normal conversation with them so yeah yeah so what else do you have for us um we can talk about some of those contributing factors to hearing loss in general uh people can have genetic or hereditary 
flaws in their hearing. Um, age is, of course, an issue. Everything slows down as we get older, and so our nerve fibers are not as effective. Mm -hmm. um, infectious diseases, tumors, but not a cancerous tumor. It's a tumor that is malignant by position. Um, ironically, the hearing nerve, which is your eighth cranial nerve, your vestibulocochlear nerve, so there's balance and, yeah, <laughs> right? Can you name them all? Um, <laughs> it's your balance and your hearing nerve, and some people, um, they they have a, a misgrowth of cells that occur, and because it's passing through a small hole in your temporal bone, it ends up compressing on the hearing nerve, and therefore the hearing degrades. But you alleviate that compression, and then potentially your hearing can be recovered. Wow. Okay. Um, there's physical trauma, like barrow trauma. Um, I'm sure we've all heard the story of somebody water skiing and they fell and mm -hmm. hit the the water, ototoxicity. Um, there are drugs out there in the world that cause the hair cells to die. Wow. Um, so aspirin, your aminoglycosides, your erythromycin, zithromycin, all of those in high doses, they can cause ototoxicity to your ears. Yes, uh, one of the most interesting things that I um, recognized this, I always thought ototoxicity, you gotta like take it. Mm -hmm. But they did a hearing study on the Chicago Painters Union. It, they were in, inhaling the fumes and they were ototoxic. So it's not always noise. Yeah, wow. So, but then of course I emphasize noise at the end. <laughs> I've said this a hundred times, music is not noise, but your ears don't know the difference. Mm -hmm. um, what a noise induced injury or a noise type hearing injury. It is a nerve type hearing loss, which unfortunately means that it's a permanent type hearing loss because yeah. we're not gonna grow those little hair cells yeah. back. Um, it's a result of the wear and tear, again, the intensity versus duration and your subsequent exposures, the overexposure, overall overexposure. And then it shows up in a specific pattern on your audiogram um, in a V notch. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's very specific, and we can look at that too. Yeah. Um, I put in here some exposure guidelines. There are two organizations that kind of guide us here. OSHA is the Occupational Safety and Health Association, and they are mostly an industrial, so they're enforcing reg rules and regulations that have been established. Um, they are not the greatest rules, right, for the protection of the person. They're really right. talking about an industrial setting yeah. where the person is standing next to a specific noise all mm -hmm. day long. There's another group called NIOSH, and they are more of a researching, so they can make recommendations, but they are not enforcing regulation right. kind of stuff. Right. Um, but um, let's look at the hearing test. Mm -hmm. So this is an audiogram, uh, the graph on the right-hand side, and you'll see the x-axis is the frequencies going from low pitch to high pitch, left to right. The numbers on the y-axis is our uh, volume, and that's decibels and hearing level. I don't know if you want to go into that. I uh, reviewed some of my, <laughs> my facts. <laughs> nice. But the numbers, uh, they go from so very, very soft at the top of the graph to very, very loud at the bottom of the graph. Mm -hmm. And what I'm showing you here is actually an ideal within normal limits audiogram. So mm -hmm. you got the red symbols showing the right ear, the blue symbols showing the left ear. And ideally, you want to see them kind of overlaid on each other as close together as possible, as close to the top of the graph as possible, and a straight line across the way. Right. So what's one look like that? Uh... I am so glad you asked. That was good. So here they are. I gave you two little samples here. Mm -hmm. So the one on the left side, my left here, um, that's a. I mean, it's a perfect V notch. Everything stays nice and normal up into about 2,000, 2,500 hertz. It starts to drop down, and then when it recovers like that at 8,000 hertz, that's probably a younger person that has just suffered the noise exposure. Sure. Now you look at the other graph on the right right hand side and you still get that similar that drop off in that mm -hmm. same spot but see how it doesn't return all the way to normal it stays kind of low that person is probably an older person that just has a little bit of natural hearing yeah. loss on top of the noise injury yeah and then just for simplicity's sake i put it i overlaid Together. it for us nice perfect and there is no height or weight chart to hearing loss it is a function of that intensity versus duration and the sad thing or not sad it's it's in uh interesting we use that word a lot, but um, 
once you have hearing loss, your susceptibility increases. Mm -hmm. So once you know you have some of it, you, you got to be really careful. And the individual susceptibility at the very beginning is is variable. It's your right. own body, mm -hmm. right? So there are some guys that I look at, they do that NHRA stuff, that straight line racing. That's mm -hmm. a jet plane taking oh, yeah. off every time. And why don't you have no hearing left, yeah, right. <laughs> right? You have some hearing left. So individual susceptibility. Yeah, for sure. Um, and then best practices, right? What am I here for? I would like to educate people to, to know what's going on mm -hmm. and help them be more aware of what they should be doing in their own environments. So an increased awareness, measure and understand the noise levels you're around, control, and this is your department, sound absorption, structural or engineering controls, mm -hmm. protecting, choosing the right hearing protection, and it could be simply an earplug, or we could talk about in-ear monitors, but we gotta talk about how to use them safely, because yeah. if they're not used right, then they are not hearing protection. Right. You wanna validate your hearing protector, either by subsequent audiograms to make sure that you're not showing any further degradation mm -hmm. in your hearing, but there are um, objective tests where you get a, a personal attenuation rating for that item. For sure. Yeah. So aside, yeah, yeah. That I, I think that uh, like talking about the in-ear monitors, one thing that I, I see so often is that when musicians have them, and they're these perfectly molded for your ear canal, and then you always see them just take them out. Yeah. And it's it's bypassing what it what the, it's meant for. Yes. And so, thank goodness, I'm going to go back to Sensophonics, mm -hmm. right? Michael Santucci, he is a genius in the world of, of hearing conservation for musicians. Yeah. It was 20 years ago when he made his 3D active ambient ear monitor, and it was specifically to address that population of musician. Now, why does a musician take one ear out? They feel like they want to have more like in touch with the room, mm -hmm. right? So they got a poor mix. It's making them feel like they put their spacesuit on and they went and played in another room. <laughs> yep. And they desire this open ear to make them feel a little bit more a part of what's happening. So Sensephonics made an ear monitor where they put microphones on the external portion of the earphone monitor, yep. but not just any microphones, acoustics, acoustics of the ear canal. You don't want to change the way that it sounds. You want it to be transparent. Right. So they chose a MEMS microphone that replicates an open ear canal frequency response. Nice. But then he gave you control to integrate this ambient. It, it makes it, it in. It, yeah. It's, it's fun being a person that can offer that to a musician yeah. who's missed that. Yeah. Cause it, it's something that I don't think I mean, obviously, 20 years ago, he started doing that, but there's probably a lot of musicians that don't have that capability in, the, in their in their inner monitors. Correct. Yeah. And other companies tried to copy it because he had a patent on it, but they tried to drill holes in the side of your earphone monitor. And I know you always say, if water can get yeah. through, air can get through. Yeah. So why are you leaking low frequencies right. out of your earphone monitor that you probably paid extra to have four subwoofers Yeah, in? yeah. <laughs> well, and, and I, I think that... Uh, yeah, with that kind of crack, cracking the the seal there, you're you're now damaging your hearing Correct. at the same time just to try to get that experience and um and I think it's just so important to get the uh, the molds that you do for people because it's everybody's ear canal is different, you yes. know, and and it, you I I don't personally like the foam earplugs because they never seal well and they feel awkward and then they mute all the high frequencies and um with the ones that that you've done for us like the, that 15 decibel filter is perfect for me like for even concerts, like it removes a lot of the distortion. Yep. Um, uh, you go home and your ears aren't ringing. You actually hear the music more clearly. And you could talk to the person next to you yeah. without sh struggling. Yeah. So. Yeah. So how do, what's the best way for people to get a hold of you? Like um, to, if they wanted to get earplugs or anything like that. So I do have a website. Um, it's not the strongest part of my business. Sorry, folks. I am a way better audiologist than I am a digital website designer. Um, uh, I have uh, dawn at ear everything dot com is yep. my email address. And I'm sure you'll be able to put that up yep, somewhere. Pretty please. Mm -hmm. I have a Facebook presence. There's an ear everything page or you could uh, DM me directly. And then, um, yeah, I just, do I give my phone number out over no, a podcast? Yeah. Well, we, we, we'll, we'll get that all over on the, the website. But Excellent. I think, Thank I think you. that uh, I can't stress enough for people to take care of your hearing. You only get it once, especially in the profession that we're in. Um, I, I mean, I probably at least uh, a couple times, two or three times a week, I'm mentioning your name to people oh. and just saying like, hey, um, 
you know, it, it's a little bit of an investment, but it's it's nothing in compared uh, to like being able to have your hearing for long term. I sold a pair of hearing aids the other day for fifty five hundred dollars. That's a heck of a lot more than the two hundred dollars for a pair of for musicians sure. earplugs. Yeah, and and you know, I just keep them in my travel bag, and I, I you know, any situation I'm going to be in, like if I'm going to go to a concert, or go fly, like I said, um, man, just to have them available is is. Uh, just a, a a real blessing. So I appreciate you doing that for us. That's been another episode of The Sound Project. Thanks for being a part of it. What are some of the loud noise sources in your life that you should, probably should be wearing earplugs for? Please comment that below and we'll see you next week. <laughs>